Good evening, everybody. My name is David Bell. I'm the president of Quorum, and it's a great pleasure, very warmly, to welcome everyone to this rather amazing webinar. Uh, the only sadness is we can't see you all, but we know you're there. And thank you very, very much for coming to discuss and see a lot more about Charlie Chaplin and the story of care on the 100th anniversary of The Kid, a wonderful film. So without more ado, I would like to hand over to Carol Homden, who's the Chief Executive of Quorum, to get the ball rolling. Thank you. Thank you, David, and welcome to all friends, old and new from across the world, uh, to Charlie Chaplin and the story of care. And this marks two important milestones in our history. Established in 1739 as the Foundling Hospital, Quorum is the oldest and longest continuing charity for children. Created by Thomas Quorum, who you can see behind me, after a 17 year campaign to provide care and education for children abandoned on the streets of London and whose mothers were unable to care for them. Our archive holds the records of 27,000 children who were in our care each one of them a poignant story of loss and hope. Many of these records are fragile. And thanks to a grant from the National Lottery Heritage Fund, we're now engaged in digitizing them to preserve them and to bring them to new audiences. So we may all better understand the story of care and the continuing issues of today. This week, we have achieved the first important step and launched the new Quorum Story web uh, website and the first ever timeline of care from the birth of Thomas Quorum in 1668 to the present day. And one of the key dates on this timeline that we are recognizing is 1921 and the release of Charlie Chaplin's The Kid in America, which opened in London in August. And it's Chaplin's most personal film relating as it does to his own experience of care in London as a child. So we're delighted to celebrate the centenary of this classic movie of the silent era, which brought to millions the story at the heart of Coram's history as the founding hospital, that of a baby left by a mother in the hope of a better life. And with me tonight is Kate Guillaume-Varche, director of the Chaplin Office, and Bryony Dixon, expert from the BFI, to explore Charlie Chaplin and the story of care. There will be clips, so please bear with us if there are any technological uh, glitches, we're all terrified. Um, and you will need to adjust the sound on your own devices for you to enjoy Chaplin's own delightful music. This is a webinar format which is being recorded, so only the speakers will be seen. But after the presentations, I will open the Q&A, that's the Q&A and not the chat, um, for what I have no doubt will be a fascinating exploration of both Chaplin's contribution to film, uh, his own life, and a century of care. So throughout this, you can type in your questions into the Q&A event. So first, and without any more ado, it is my pleasure to introduce Kate Guillaume-Varche to delve into the real life of Charlie Chaplin. Kate. Thank you, Carol. Um, it's a real delight to be here and to be, to, to be celebrating the kid with you. It was something that I wanted to do for a long time and I'm really glad that we've managed to do it even though we're only online and not in person. Um, so I'm, I'm going to tell you about um, Chaplin's childhood and we have, you won't be seeing my face, you'll be seeing pictures. So let's start. I've often wondered if this little boy who spent many hours in the wings of many English theatres ever dreamt that he would go so far. Charlie Chaplin was born in April 1889 in Kennington. His parents were both music hall performers. His father was quite well known as the existence of several printed song sheets with his pictures on, which with his picture on proves. They separated when Charlie was very young, leaving Hannah Chaplin to look after her two sons alone. Her health rapidly failed and she could no longer sing. Indeed, the story goes that in front of a rowdy military audience in Aldershot, she lost her voice completely and Charlie was pushed on stage to take her place and finish the song, which he did to great public acclaim and lots of penny throwing. Hannah took in sewing to make ends meet. 
Chaplin Senior soon stopped paying maintenance, in part because he resented having to pay for Sidney, who was not his son. As Charlie Chaplin wrote later, Picasso had a blue period. We had a grey one in which we lived on parochial charity, soup tickets and relief parcels. I didn't realise how many places we'd lived in. I suppose within three months we must have lived in four, five or six places. The pity of it. This poor woman with two children, from one room to another one room. In 1895, when the sewing machine had been repossessed, Hannah had sold every last possession and used up all possible family help. She was admitted to Lambeth Infirmary and Sydney, Charlie's elder half-brother, to the Lambeth workhouse. As I'm sure some of you know, the Master's Lodge of the Lambeth Workhouse is still there and now houses the Cinema Museum. Charlie's name is not on the workhouse register this time. He must have been taken in by a relation, perhaps his father. However, in summer 1896, all three of them were admitted to Newington Workhouse. Although we were aware of the shame of going to the workhouse, when Mother told us about it, both Sydney and I thought it adventurous and a change from living in one stuffy room. But on that doleful day, I didn't realize what was happening until we actually entered the workhouse gate. Then the forlorn bewilderment of it struck me, for there we were made to separate, mother going in one direction to the women's work ward and we in another to the children's. A few days later, Charlie and Sydney were transferred to the Hanwell Schools for Orphans and Destitute Children just outside London, where Sydney had spent a few months the year before, also known as Cuckoo Schools. Next slide, please. Charlie enjoyed the drive through the countryside, which he had hardly seen before. He later said that the smell after rain in the country always reminded him of Hanwell. After medical checkups, the boys were separated because of their age. They slept in different blocks and hardly ever saw each other. Charlie was miserable without his mother and brother, but at least he started learning to read and write and was very pleased with the way his name looked on paper. Sydney worked in the kitchens and occasionally managed to slip him a bread roll with a big lump of butter, a huge luxury a reminder of which you will see in one of the kid clips later. Although at Hanwell they were, in Chaplin's own words, very well looked after, he felt it was a forlorn existence. And the butter from, from Sid was not to last. At 11, a boy in care had the choice of joining the army or the navy rather than stay in the school. Sidney chose the navy and was transferred to training ship Exmouth leaving Charlie, just six years old, alone at Hanwell for the next 14 months. I'm sorry these are such bad quality, but it's just to give you an idea of the atmosphere on the ship. Here they are doing dumbbell exercises all in rows. And here we have Sydney's report from the Exmouth. General conduct, very good, I'm glad to see. At seven, Charlie was transferred from the infants to the older boys department at Hanwell and became eligible to participate in all the drills, exercises and twice weekly walks outside the school. When his autobiography was published in the 1960s, letters to newspapers confirmed his description of Hanwell. With luggage labels around our necks, we were delivered like some frightened cargo. How well Charlie describes the horrors and cruelties, floggings and ringworm, said one. I was given six lashes just for feeding the hungry sparrows who hopped in the hallway while we dined, said another. Those days will never be forgotten, especially regarding discipline. It was just like being in the army, wrote a third. As an aside, in 1921, when Chaplin went back to London from the United States, he invited children from Hoxton to visit him at the Ritz. That must have been a huge treat. And during his 1931 visit, he visited Hanwell School and organized for the children to see city lights. Charlie was discharged from Hanwell in eight, January 1898. Sid came back from the Exmouth and they spent a few months with their mother, only to return into care that summer. Hannah's mental health was deteriorating and when she was transferred to Cane Hill Asylum, the workhouse, workhouse board insisted that Chaplin Senior take charge of the children. So they were discharged into his care. Music hall artists were encouraged to drink after the show with audience members and Charlie's father was by then a full-blown alcoholic, if he hadn't been before. His new companion Louise did not appreciate the appearance of the two boys in the household and was not very kind to them, especially Sydney, who she, she seemed to dislike upon sight. The boys spent as much time out of the house as they possibly could. Finally, Hannah was discharged from the asylum and took them both back. 
and soon afterwards, Charles, C Charles Senior found Charlie Junior a job with the eight Lancashire lads. Charlie's not in this picture, a team of child clog dancers in return for food and board and half a crown a week for Hannah. Charlie may be in this picture, some people claim he is, I'm not sure about that. No more care homes for little Charlie, but something possibly more alarming, a different lodging in a different town nearly every week, nice or horrible depending on the landlady, and also a different school whenever the lad stayed long enough in one town. No wonder his education suffered. He had very little sense of security for 18 months, apart from the presence of his mates in the troop, with whom he practiced every acrobatic and juggling trick they could think of, copying the other acts they saw on stage while waiting their turn. This picture was published in the magazine when Chaplin was famous, claiming that that is Charlie Chaplin in the, in the front. Perhaps it is. When the troupe returned to London for an engagement in a London theatre, Hannah thought Charlie looked unwell and insisted he leave the Lancashire lads in spite of the money. So he did odd jobs while she sewed blouses. For example, he was an errand boy in a chandler's shop, a doctor's boy, a page boy, he worked for a newsagent, he was a glass blower and a printer's assistant for a day until it was obvious he wasn't strong enough to lift the machines. Sidney came home from his job as a naval bugler with money. When it ran out, he went off again and mother and brother waited anxiously for his next return. Unfortunately, this time he fell ill and the ship left him in Cape Town to recover. Hannah lost her mind from malnutrition and exhaustion and was taken to the asylum. Charlie lied to the authorities saying he could stay with a relative, but he was actually on his own and spent much of the time hanging out with woodchoppers who kindly looked after him. Sydney returned just in time, at a point when Charlie, in his own words, was a derelict at 12. Badly spelt, but that's what he meant. It was a very dirty little urchin who went to meet Sid at Waterloo Station. My brother came to my rescue, he wrote later. Indeed, he did. Sydney paid for new clothes and Charlie could sign on at a theatrical agency. From 1903 onwards, he was more or less permanently employed in the theatre. An important break was the role of Billy in Sherlock Holmes, a 40 week tour, though a solitary time since he was the only child in the cast. As Billy, Master Chaz Chaplin is decidedly clever, said one review, and another, Charles Chaplin performed wonders for a youngster. There were more tours of Sherlock Holmes with the famous William Gillette, who in 1916 actually starred in a film of the show that was recently restored and in which I was happy to see the character Charlie played performed of course by a different boy, and at last understand why there were two different costumes, the page boy and his disguise as a newspaper boy to help Sherlock spy on someone in the street. We're missing a slide there, please. There's the two costumes. I never understood why there were two. I thought it was two different plays. Next, Chaplin signed up with Casey's Circus to play, among other things, the part of Fagin in Oliver Twist which Carol Homden pointed out earlier, is an interesting link with Coram, seeing as Charles Dickens lived around the corner from the Foundling Hospital and petitioned often for the admission of mothers. What is more, Mr. Brownlow in Oliver may well have been named after the secretary of Coram at the time. Back to Chaplin at Casey's Circus. Here he is, looking very young, doing an imitation of Dr. Walford Bodie famous charlatan, showman, hypnotist, hypnotist, ventriloquist, and stage magician that everybody in the audience would have known at the time. And then finally, thanks to Sydney, who had been working there for a couple of years, Chaplin, aged nine, 17, was signed up by the hugely successful music hall impresario, Fred Carno, and rapidly became, as Sydney already was, one of the biggest stars of Fred Carno's army. After months touring the UK and some performances at the Folie Bergère in Paris, the particular Carnot troupe that Chaplin was in left for America, with Charlie Chaplin as their lead, as you can see from, from his name on the posters here. And here he is in the main roles of the Carnot sketches, the inebriate and Archibald in a sketch called Skating. And just for fun, here are two offstage photographs of the Carnot troupe in their spare time in the USA. First in Colorado Springs, where Charlie Standing looks very young, so that must be the 1910-11 tour. And the next one near the Mexican border, a couple of years later during their second tour. 
which I absolutely love. I love their clothes and their bags and everything. During that second tour in 1913, and this slide was one of their final performances in Kansas City with Chaplin in the center, one of Charlie's final performances with, with them, I mean, Charles Chaplin left the theater for good, enticed by an interesting financial offer from Max Sennett of the Keystone Film Company. He was in the movies. And the rest of the story will be taken up by, by Bryony um, just after Carol, I believe. Thank you very much, Kate. A fascinating insight you see into Chaplin's own experiences in London. And on the day that Chaplin was born, uh, four babies were admitted to the care of Coram, the Foundling Hospital. Two girls and two boys. And they were presented often by mothers who faced destitution and uh, also the stigma of illegitimacy. Now, this is a path which could so easily have been Chaplin's own at a time when the alternative for women and older children like Charlie was the workhouse. The kid opens with the image of the woman whose sin is motherhood, leaving the charity hospital. And here it is behind me, the still from the film and the mother leaving. And I've set it against the original Foundling Hospital building, which was a hospital not for mothers, but for their children. And the echoes for me are really resonant. Finding herself without means, the woman in the film makes the agonizing decision to leave her baby in a car with a note, asking whoever finds him to care for him. Coram's archive includes such notes, um, and one of, the, one of the most poignant ones is probably, go gentle babe, and may all your life be happiness and love. Our archive includes thousands of fabric tokens left with children, half of which were given to the mother in case she should be able to return. Only a very few ever did. The children lived in an institution, they had access to education, and they were supported into work. Very often, like Charlie's brother, into the army, or for girls, into service. For most, the aim was an ordinary life. Some, but very few, like the opera singer Mercy Draper, are stories of rags to riches, but these are the exception. To tell us how Charlie made his way in the world and came to make the kid is Bryony Dixon from the BFI. Thank you, Bryony. Hi. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for having me. Um, I'm one of the curators at the BFI National Archives, and my job is to look after old films, um, not the kid, but other films such as the kid. And my background is in um, economic and social history. So I'm also fascinated by this um, history of, of care and Chaplin's story seems to bring together um, these two things so superbly. It's such a fascinating story of somebody who escaped, um, you know, the fate that society probably had in store for him, such as had happened to his parents and um, has this extraordinary trajectory um, to be as famous as you can possibly get um, in Hollywood. In fact, he's responsible for the rise of Hollywood in, to a very great extent. You know, he is one of the people that um, sort of institute the star system, as it were. He then uses his um, privileged position as his great star to throw a light on poverty through his art and through his comedy. Um, and I think what is so very special about the kid is this ability to combine these two things because it's not a obvious mix. And in fact, um, he had quite a lot of trouble to, um, to mix these things. People didn't think that mixture of um, tragedy and comedy was, was a good idea at all. Anyway, enough. I will start with uh, a clip 
we're going to jump forward in time from where Kate has left us uh, with uh, Chaplin on his way to America. And we are now in 1921. He is the most famous man in the world. And he has made his most autobiographical film, The Kid. And it's, um, I'm just going to explain before we start uh, what's happened in the film so far. So as Carol has said, we have um, a young mother who has uh, an illegitimate child. She's left it in a limousine, hoping that the well-to-do family will take care of her child and uh, immediately regrets it. But in the meantime, the baby is stolen by villains um, and they dump it in this alleyway here that I have behind me. Uh, along comes the tramp, our favourite character, Chaplin, and he picks up the baby um, and then tries to get rid of it again. Uh, doesn't know what to do with it. And there's a beautiful scene um, where he tries to keep trying to give the baby away to various people and it keeps coming back. Um, then there's a lovely moment where he finally connects with the child and um, it's the beginning of this absolutely charming relationship between the tramp and the child, the baby. And this is the scene that we're going to see now. So here is Charlie and the baby in their tenement room. <laughs>
I love the inventiveness of that um, that scene and all the little tricks that he does um, with the baby and um, the sort of social pretensions they have about saying grace and like and not eating with your knife or at least not the sharp side. Um, and I also think that I might borrow that poncho idea. I think straight out of bed and into the tablecloth sort of coverlet, bed coverlet thing. It's a brilliant lockdown suggestion. Anyway, um, the other great thing about this also is, of course, Chaplin composed the music for this score. Um, it seems almost unfair that anybody should be quite so talented, not only to be a, a fantastic comic, but also a brilliant musician. So we can see um, the resonance we between the garrets that we see in this tenement block in, in wherever in America um, and what must have been the, the attic room in Powell Terrace that Kate was describing to us. Uh, and we can see him, I think, trying to refer in some way to, to his background here. He never kind of admits to it very openly um, in his autobiography that the kid is autobiographical, uh, but I think it must have been. But how was it that a poor musical performer from London was allowed this extraordinary platform to talk to millions of cinema goers around the world? When we left him, he had um, arrived in America and was touring round with Carnot's show, had been discovered uh, by Max Sennett and offered a job in what was becoming Hollywood in Los Angeles. Um, so he takes the job, which is reasonably well paid. And after a rather slow start uh, and some coaching from Mabel Normans, Chaplin um, settles in to performing for the camera rather than on the stage. Uh, he starts in February, 1914 and by April, 1914. He's directing all his own comedies. He's developed the tramp character that we come to love so much and which becomes popular throughout the world. Um, and by December, he's already left Keystone with a deal for another company at a massively increased salary. Um, he has his brother Sidney with him, helping him negotiate these contracts. And he goes from company to company, um, and success to success. Uh, he's able to negotiate not only more money, but in, crucially more control over his films. Um, and his popularity increases exponentially. So by the time um, of the First World War, um, and in fact, due to the First World War disseminating his films, he really is the most famous person in the world. And he works staggeringly hard, um, but he's a perfectionist and he takes infinite trouble with his craft and his films uh, and pr production begins to slow right down. Um, it drives the movie companies completely bananas. Um, the pressure is always on him to produce more and more films. So by the time um, he gets to the kid in 1921. Um, he's negotiated himself to his first million dollar deal, a uh, really extraordinary achievement, uh, particularly from a you know poor boy from Kennington. Um, and the kid's his first long film. Um, you know, it's it's an hour long, so it's a sort of feature film. Um, and it's made a very poignant time during his life. He's um, kind of had to marry somebody um, who was pregnant. Uh, they have a child, but the child dies after a few days. Um, very sad. Uh, he's been working solidly at film for seven years and years of grueling stage shows as well. Um, and he's very tired. Uh, the kid is fantastically successful uh, but he then has to go on to make a few more films and he's basically burnt out and it's at this point that he decides he wants to go home 
He just wants to get home like we all do at some point in our life. And um, he decides to return to London for the first time in a decade. Um, very significant point in his life because, you know, when he goes home, he's mobbed, absolutely mobbed because everybody loves him. They adore him so much. He's this massive celebrity and he can barely get a moment to go and look at the outside of Powell Terrace and kind of, you know, make recollect himself um, and have a moment just on his own. So it's this moment in his life and expressed through the film, The Kid, uh, that he's trying to deal, we think, with the trauma of his um, life, his separation from his mother. And although the locations are American, it, it is, I think, recognisable um, as London. Certainly the London audience uh, thought that this was the case when the film was released. And of course, it was tricky to put over this um, story, which has got this uh, great pathos to it um, with the child uh, within a comedy film. And it was a real risk because people knew him and loved him as a comedian, a slapstick comedian. And the um, company who was releasing the film were not quite sure it was going to work. It was described as a, a comedy with a catch in the throat which I think is a very good description of, of the clip we're going to see in a moment. It's a really fascinating film, actually. It's um, deceptively simple, um, but you can feel the raw emotion in it. And I think that this really does, because it's so intense, I think it must be personal to Chaplin. The other thing, um, has been alluded to already is the um, distinct um, shadow of Dickens' Oliver Twist in this film. And interestingly, the adorable Jackie Coogan, who plays the kid here, um, goes on to play Oliver Twist the following year, 1922. Um, and I think Chaplin must have seen a bit of his childhood self in, in Jackie Coogan, who was a brilliant performer. Um, at such a, a young age. And it's a big part of the appeal of the kid and later of Oliver Twist too. But I think what really touches us at the, the heart of this story, um, that despite society's strictures, which we're about to see some of and, and intolerance of society at that time, uh, the message is, is that people can help. There's always room for a, a little one. So here's the moment that the kid gets sick, uh, which means the doctor has to be called in and um, the child is subjected to the tender mercies of the authorities. <laughs>
Thank you very much indeed, Bryony, and for that um, most helpful demonstration of quite how Chaplin made that journey. And I wanted to point out that, of course, Chaplin made his film in the aftermath of the flu pandemic and world war, uh, which had, of course, given whole, the whole of society in America, like the UK, the mass experience uh, of loss. And when the film was distributed, the themes it spoke to were absolutely poignant to so many uh, families and its beauty uh, and pathos made it a huge success. We know that films were shown on this very site behind me to the foundling children um, in the 1920s. We do not know whether they ever saw the kid. And I think even our former pupils who are with us are now uh, too young to remember that. We do know, of course, that the admissions of children in the same circumstances uh, as Chaplin had been in the previous decades continued, and that it remained rare for a mother to be able to return as Chaplin ends his film uh, in, in hopeful expectation of, um, before the radical changes in the care system, uh, which came after the Second World War. And you will be able to find out more about that journey of care uh, through the quorumstory.org.uk website. So now we are very fortunate to have great expertise available to us in the audience as well as our speakers. And we do already have some questions in the Q&A, uh, some relating to care and some relating to film. So I thought that we would start with that question of um, the care system itself and how it changed and before returning to the film itself. And I wanted to invite Jan Kenyuk, who is the Associate Director of the Quorum Center for Early Permanence and former head of our adoption service for many years, to comment on the first question, which was, well, what have been the significant changes in care since Chaplin's experience? Jan, are you there? I can't hear Jan's response. Now, can you hear me now? Yes? Yes, yes we can. that's yes. right. I managed to unmute. Well, I mean, it is a different world, thank goodness, because, I mean, poverty and destitution were seen as a moral sin, and it was a great reluctance to provide any care for families or children. Whereas now, despite the shortcomings of our systems, we do recognize that children are precious and need looking after and their families, they belong in their families and a huge amount of support is actually available if you compare it to those days. Institutional care is really not regarded as appropriate at all for young children and only under you know, particular circumstances for specialist care for sometimes children with special needs. Um, so families are supported, children have, are regarded as having rights, they don't only need physical care and provision, but their emotional needs are seen as important, their needs for, for you know, stability, love, affection, and there's a huge amount of effort goes into keeping children in their own families, for those children where their families can't care for them, when I mean, there is also sort of a lot of thoughts given to public provision through foster care and for some children through adoption. I think yeah, I can't go into huge detail, Carol, but the world has changed, thank goodness. Thank you, Jan. And it does seem to me that there's never been a more poignant moment for us to reflect on this century mm -hmm. than now as we face the aftermath and catch up for children um, in this century from the pandemic um, a century later or indeed in the very week that government has announced an independent review of children's social care, mm -hmm. to which Forum will be contributing strongly. So I'd now like to return, thank you, Jeanne, if you could go yeah. on mute again now, um, uh, to return to some of the questions that have been asked around the film itself. And uh, particularly, I, I think maybe Kate uh, wants, would want to answer this, I'm not sure, or Bryony, I don't mind, but the questions around Jackie Coogan, the, the, the kid himself. 
So how old he was and, um, you know, how he came to play that role. What was his story? Um, shall I answer that one, Brian? Is that OK? Oh, um, I can't remember how old he was. Was he five or, or I think, I think he was six. five, six. And yeah. um, so Charlie, as Brian said, he, he was kind of at a loose end before making the kid, in fact. Already, he didn't have any ideas in his head. He didn't know what film to make. He had a contract to fulfill with First National who who um, he had to make eight films for them to distribute and he'd only made four, I think. And he was, he, he was, and then he, and then his baby died, four year, four days old, his baby died. And he was devastated, even though his relationship with his wife was not um, brilliant. Um, and he, a few weeks later, he went to a music hall show or a vaudeville show. And there was a guy called Jack Coogan singing, performing, dancing. And when he, um, at the end of his act, his son came on and did a little dance and the audience went wild, so he did it again. And he was just, uh, as you can see on screen, he was just amazing. And suddenly um, the next day, I think Chaplin thought I should, uh, he heard that somebody else had taken on Jack Coogan for a film and he thought, oh no, I should have done that. And it turned out it was Jack and not Jackie. And so they were able to take on Jackie and the story just went from there. I mean, they, they played together, they, they raced snails together. They had a really fun relationship. He, he kind of found the baby he hadn't had. He had the time and, and the inclination to play with him. And um, Coogan was obviously an amazing little boy. I mean, mm. his face is just extraordinary and his acting skills are fantastic. And he mirrored everything that Chaplin did and he was a fantastic pupil. Thank you, Kate. And he went on to play Oliver Twist, I gather, uh, which again makes that link and that resonance to these uh, this, these stories and the centrality of the, the story of the orphan or the foundling child in so much of children's uh, literature, in fact. And we, we, we have been asked, Kate, uh, whether he, Chaplin, where was Chaplin born, exactly where? And he was definitely born in London, wasn't he? Um, yes, there is there is some discussion at the moment about whether he was born in um, just outside Birmingham on a gypsy caravan site, Smethwick or something patch, I can't, black patch. Um, but as far as we know, he himself said he was born in London. Um, and so we, for the moment, as we have no proof of, of anything else, we, we just follow him, what he said. Thank you. And um, Jerry uh, from the audience is, is rather intriguingly said that he has a signed photo of Silas Hathaway, who is the, uh, I believe, the baby. What, what do we know about him? Is he is he still alive? Yes, apparently, yes, he's still alive. Um, I, I don't think people, somebody said to me recently that we should, um, because I work for the chaplain office and we manage the rights and the archives and everything. And we do lots of things on social media and things. And somebody recently said, well, you, should, you should do something with Silas Hathaway. And I thought, yeah, that'd be great. But does he remember being in the kit? <laughs> possibly, possibly not. No. Very good. Well, we, we've also got some questions. Bryony, we've got a question here about the score. Yes. Um, and and uh, whether this is the, the 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 one that we've just seen, whether that is the the the, the same as was written, uh, you know, has it changed? And and how did he come to have that kind of skill to write a full orchestral score? I know it's extraordinary, isn't it? Really extraordinary. Um, he he came from such a musical background. I think he he had it in him. He also played the violin. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm sure he, he actually, Kate probably knows more about this than I do, but I mean, he probably had help um, doing some of the orchestration, but he had an ear for a tune, that's sure. Um, and, and, you know, if, if anyone knows the song Smile, you know, so the, one of the most famous songs ever made, um, uh, he was very, very good. He was a natural, you know, as he was a natural mover. You know, it's, it's not so much almost the comedy. He, he's balletic. You know, mm. he's very, very um, rapid in his movements. Um, I, loved, um, I love that little slapstick moment on the roof there where he's scrabbling to get his feet up. You know, he's just so accomplished. Um, one of the questions uh, from Brian uh, is, do you think there's ever been a comparable superstar to Chaplin? Um, no. 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 
I think you know, you've unique. I think you need to amplify <laughs> the thoughts of it, Ronnie. He's unique. I mean, in the film world, uh, it's because he's the first. I think that you know he's he rides that kind of wave of the rise of Hollywood, and and as I say, he's partly responsible for it um, because he is so good, and because he's got this universal appeal. So it doesn't matter, and also because it was silent cinema, uh, the films travelled to every part of the world. So the Russians loved him, the Chinese and the Japanese and the Indians loved him. Everybody loved him. Uh, the French, you know, the avant-gardists thought, thought he was the best thing ever. So he had this sort of iconic translatable quality. Um, so I don't think there will ever be anyone quite like him because he was a product, but also a manipulator of his times. Yes, and, and it quite a, a quite extraordinarily multifaceted performer and, and creator, and over such a sustained period as well, um, uh, 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 and such a range of topics. And Kate, one of the other questions that come in, just thinking about Jackie, I mean, one of the things Jeanne was saying was that, of course, attachment is now much better understood. Um, this this was not a concept that, that, that existed in the time of Thomas Coram, or indeed, pretty much right up to the time of this film. But did Jackie Coogan, he obviously had such an extraordinary um, relationship with Chaplin uh, on that set. Did he reflect upon that and what it meant to him in his um, life? He, went, he kind of went on to have a very, I mean, he became a star obviously after the kid and famous all, over, all through the world. And then, so he, he, he carried on, he made several films, one after the other, Circus Days, Oliver's Twist. Um, I can't remember the names of the others, but he, he carried on making cinema as a child star and toured the world. I mean, I know he came to Paris at one point and- um, And London. And London. Um, we have film of him in London. Oh gosh, and I don't, I don't, um, and then, and it all petered out and, and catastrophically um, when he came of age, it turned out that his um, parents had not saved the money that he had made, they had spent it all. And so he was actually the origin of a thing called the, the Coogan Act in the US, which um, is a law um, that was passed to make parents um, keep their child actors money and put it to child performers money to, to, to one side for them when they grow up. And um, I don't know what he did in his sort of 30s, 40s, but I don't know what age he was, but he was then became very famous as being um, Uncle Fester in the Adams family. So the beautiful child aged <laughs> five turned into this monstrous looking character um, when he was older. Right, thank you. And Bryony, um, there's some questions here about, again, a bit more about Chaplin's craft here. He did his own stunts, didn't he? Certainly, yes. He, he invented a lot of those um, stunts and a lot of them came also from the English musical background. So mm -hmm. part of the reason that he was um, headhunted by Max Sennett in the first place was because um, he had this uh, acrobatic facility you know there's a kind of basic level of performance that they were looking for um in fact um the quote i think was oh look he can do a 108 now we always wondered what on earth what on earth is a 108 um maybe they mean 180 like a flick or something but actually a 108 is a very specific practful where you fall flat on your face and then you sort of bounce back upwards um, so it's a kind of figure of eight kind of thing. And he could do that with, with ease, uh, as could Sidney, his brother, yeah. uh, also a very good acrobat who could fall backwards downstairs and then stand upright on his head. Extraordinary. Extraordinary. Yeah. On film. And um, Roger, Roger Macy asked a question, which is um, very interesting, which is when the tramp is folding the nappies, which we just saw there, um, he looks up and he looks directly at the camera. Um, do you, is that not very unusual of the time? And, and it, it, what does yeah. that mean? What it, did that it's, mean? It's breaking the fourth wall. Um, and this is a thing that is, again, comes from the English musical background. In fact, it comes from the Commedia dell'arte, 
going way, way, way back. Probably the ancient Greeks did it. So it's the knowing look um, to the to the audience from the the clown mm -hmm. performer. Mm -hmm. um, very few performers are allowed to do it. It's only this sort of character in a kind of stock company that's allowed to do that. Right. It's an aside. It's called an aside in the theatre. Yes, absolutely. And Jerry has also come in and said, um, "Do are children and young people in London interested in Chaplin? And does Coram show the film to them? Well, we are one of the largest providers of what today would be called citizenship education and personal, social and health education. And uh, we're certainly working with Kate to explore whether we might be able to do a module on uh, Charlie Chaplin and the story of care uh, that would sit alongside our other curriculum, including one on Thomas Coram, of course. Um, and, and Chaplin Office indeed does have some very good resources uh, for schools. But I think, yes, I, I think it, it's really fantastically important that um, young people have the opportunity to see um, this story and also how much can be communicated without words. Um, and certainly doesn't require... Um, a, a, um, a text, uh, for example. So, Kate, uh, do you find that there's interest in the younger generation? Well, I I, I live in France, and um, there's a huge amount of cinema cinema culture and um, early cinema culture, and everybody knows Charlie Chaplin from um, I don't know the delivery guy who comes to the office to to just sort of. They all grew up, but people might, you know, people in their 20s still seem to have grown up with Charlie Chaplin, which is absolutely not the case in the UK. Um, and there are a lot of sort of programs for schools where they show the circus, the kid, and children do see them a lot. Um, I don't think it's the, the, the case in the UK, and I would love to see it the case because what happens is the children don't want to watch it. They say it's black and white, oh, it's black and white, it's, oh, you know, there's no talking. And then they, you know, they just can't take their eyes off him, and, and like, as we can't. And they, they sit there till the end of the film. So, I mean, it's once you get them in front of the film, they, they love it. But it's, it's quite difficult to have the whole procedure to get that to happen nowadays. Yes, absolutely. Uh, well, um, I will speak to this later, but we do hope to further celebrate the centenary of the kid later and potentially to host a children and schools um, screening of it. Um, subject, of course, to all the extraordinary things that uh, we may have to put into place or wait for. There's a number of questions about Charlie's uh, family and wider family relationships. There was reference to whether it's rumor, I don't know that, that he may have had um, gypsy uh, family connections. Did he have other siblings? And where was the rest of his family whilst this uh, journey was happening? Uh, do, do either of you know? Kate, you presumably you know. Well, he had Sydney, his half brother, who I mentioned earlier, and he had another half brother called Wheeler Dryden, who was also a, a performer um, and who ended up working at the Chaplin Studios in the 19, late 1930s. Um, and his mother, Hannah, his father died when he was mm, seven, eight of alcoholism. And his mother was brought over to the States by Sydney and um, Charlie in the early 1920s. Oh, not, not 21 after then, um, sort of, I think it was 23, can't remember, sorry. And um, there were cousins in London that they used to visit. There were, there was, people had part, there's somebody, Aubrey Chaplin had a pub. And so he used to go and see him. And Aubrey also looked after Hannah when Charlie and Sydney were in the States. Um, so cousins and things, yes. Um, other family, I mean, and obviously he himself had many children. He had two, two sons in America and then he had eight children with Una O'Neill, um, who are my bosses who I work for, and they too have many children. Yes, so families of many children. And of course, one of the biggest changes really um, in, in recent times has been the importance of that kinship network and the search for that kinship network uh, where children do need alternative care. Uh, Distin, I think, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, uh, if you are there, you have made such a fascinating uh, comment in, in, in the Q&A and I wondered whether you, you might be prepared 
to share that thinking a little more for us, if David can help bring you in, Distin Johnson. Um, is that possible? Uh, we'll just have to pause one second. Um, and th this comment, oh, here we are, we have Distin. Uh, it's so kind of you to share that. Uh, oh. Would you just comment to us about I didn't, it? I didn't expect to, um, to be on screen, but thank oh. you. It's Please absolutely. don't if you don't wish to be. But <laughs> no, it's <absolutely> now. <laughs> no, and I used to know Bryony way back in the very early days of Chaplin, cha Chaplin nice societies. Yeah, lovely to see you. Yeah, I, 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 um, I've been a Chaplin fan since early childhood, and um, I most recently um, had worked as a therapeutic foster parent, which is why I look exhausted. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and I would use Chaplin films quite often with children who had suffered trauma. Um, the kid is obviously a very difficult one. I would, I would sometimes use that with older teenagers if they were, if I felt that they were able to cope with the, with the um, difficult scenes in that. But obviously the humor really helps, really helps them connect. And actually the lack of language in silent films is a really helpful tool in, in getting nonverbal feelings coming to the surface for children who've suffered a trauma with caregivers and um, also, I, I would use Laurel and Hardy sometimes as well, you know, because there's a film in which Stan Laurel um, flops a lot. There's a state of, of um, fear, which includes um, fight, flight and flop. And there's another Thank one for me there, Carol. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for sharing that with us. And uh, um, what I was going to note also was the unusual thing in this film that um, Chaplin, of course, is a male caregiver and that the attachment uh, is formed and that he picks up the baby, uh, which is, uh, you know, was certainly uh, a missing experience for uh, so many of the children who were presented to the founding hospital. The other area before we close that I wanted to pick on that's, of course, a thread through our questions is this whole question of the judgment and moral, uh, the, 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 the stigma um, associated and, and also poverty as a driver. And I think we all recognize that uh, what we would call the toxic trio of, of poverty and addiction and violence are still um, fuelers of um, the issues that, that children may face that may lead to them uh, needing the support of children's services. Um, and you know, perhaps things in some ways are therefore quite eternal in terms of the, uh, the story of care, but we're distinguished by the response that we make to it. And uh, maybe it's a comment rather than a question, uh, but the, I repeat that I think perhaps there's never been a more important time for us to think about uh, those issues. And it was still well into the middle um, in even later in the in the 20th century uh, that mothers were facing this extraordinarily difficult choice uh, of um, being unable to care because of the judgment of the society and Thomas Coram was way out of his time in uh, not uh, judging in such a way. Uh, I thought it might be good if we can, David, just to bring in Carol Harris, uh, our social historian uh, at Coram, who might like to comment on that journey uh, in relation to the, the attitudes, as it were, to the mother um, facing that choice. Carol, are you there? I hope Carol is going to be there. Yes, uh, she's mute, of course. Oh God, so bad with the tech. Um, yeah, I, I think one of the things, I, I did have a look at the film this afternoon because I had something I should have been doing and it was a, a, a useful distraction. <laughs> and uh, it is just such a lovely film. And I thought one of the things that really struck me was the the way that the mother is portrayed is is very different to how she would have been seen and talked about as, as the kind of mother who brought a child to the foundling hospital across or brought her child to the workhouse in the case of, of Chaplin's mother. And I think it's a really, 
I'm trying to think of something positive, but it is quite a depressing thread that that goes on. The the idea that you know, we don't now talk about children in the care system being you know, sinful in the way um, used to be used to be the case that mothers were regarded as sinful for having children outside of marriage, um, and the children themselves were regarded in that way. Um, it's it's still there is still a lot of stigma we know obviously from our own sort of the children in in quorums kind of ambit it's one of the things that that's talked about a lot and and it is quite I think it's really one of the most powerful things of the film is is to see the way the mother's the mother of the child is portrayed in in what looks like a very sympathetic light, but is is would have been an incredibly sympathetic light for the war as it time. Time. Yes. And I, this point about the stigma, um, as part of the story of Care Voices Through Time programme, young people who are care experienced today are working with us to explore their history, the, the heritage of care, and to share their stories and to work with us uh, on campaign on a campaign for tackling the contemporary stigma of care. That assumption that children in care are troubled or troublesome, um, uh, rather than individuals who have had difficult experiences and have their whole life in front of them. And uh, please do watch out for um, the material that our young people will be sharing um, in coming weeks. And I just wanted to ask Shan to come back in before we close. Um, to just touch again on that point about uh, the mother's dilemma and the ways in which Thomas Coram was so pioneering, uh, but also the sort of dual promise that the Foundling Hospital uh, was trying to make of the time. Shan, are you there? Yes. Oh. Is that it? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Right. I mean, I just also want to say how much I've enjoyed this evening and how wonderful it was to see Charlie Chaplin again and that gorgeous little boy. I've been asked to turn on my video. I thought I had. Is it on? Is that right? Is that better? No, you just disappeared again. <laughs> what the... I don't know. Hello. There I am. There I am. Okay. Right. Now, just saying how much I'd enjoyed it and how grateful I am. I mean, I think I would just like to say that I do think society's attitudes to unmarried mothers and single women as mothers has changed. I mean, in the 1960s, 1950s, 1940s, babies were adopted simply because, God, my battery's going. Would you believe it? <laughs> Um, simply because their mothers were unmarried. These days, that just doesn't happen. Families are supported. Women are supported. I don't, can you hear me? Yes. Am I, have you lost me entirely? No, thank you, Eugene, but I think we'll, we'll mute you, given that your battery is about to go. Okay, okay. Um, Sorry about that. So, as you say, there are many initiatives. The PAUSE initiative, the Family Drug and Alcohol Court initiative, which is, uh, for example, seeking to ensure... Um, that uh, mothers in desperate circumstances uh, can be supported and uh, what we might think of as the cycle of care uh, does not uh, repeat itself. Um, so for, uh, we are drawing to a close now on our, on our uh, evening. You can of course watch the kid in full. We opted for discussion and illumination of Chaplin's own history, but please do go and watch the film again in all the multiple ways that you can. Um, and uh, also for Chaplin, um, the journey from the London workhouse to international stardom was through the musical. And uh, later this year in May, if we can, or later if we have to, uh, Coram will hold a gala evening screening with the kind permission of Chaplin uh, office of the kid with Chaplin's score performed live and orchestrally at Wilton's Music Hall. And I hope that at least some of you uh, will join us uh, if and when we are able uh, to do that. I hope also uh, that you will enjoy uh, exploring quorumstory.org.uk and exploring the story of care still further and perhaps consider joining the Quorum Society. But for this evening, the final scene uh, must go uh, to Charlie Chaplin, to the mother and the kid. 
So please bear with us.